Hello everyone and good evening. It's Tuesday night. It's time for tuning up with Iggy and Dave. Dave, how are you? I'm exhausted, Iggy. How are you? <laughs> well, Dave is exhausted because the last couple of weeks, of course, we started our summer season at the Waikiki Shell, uh, the Starlight Series. And by the way, we here at the beautiful Hawaii Theater Center. Uh, so exhausted, Dave. I'm a little tired too, but not as exhausted. Dave, uh, tremendous work to get this uh, season started. Uh, lots of what? Logistics, safety protocols, music. Uh. You name it. We had a opportunity to address a number of issues returning to live performances. Some predicted, some quite unpredicted. Um, but uh, we, it was a thrill to have an audience back with us. And I, th I thought you said it so well the other night, whether it's 20 people or 200 people or 302 people. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how many are in the audience, the orchestra brings their A game every single night, so. Yeah, so we couldn't do it without the audience and everyone else. Uh, tonight we are very, very super excited to welcome two special guests. Um, I'll start with the person next to Dave. He likes to be called Gonzo. Um, and next to me is Zach Lum, and you're both from uh, somewhat, well, you both are alumni of the Kamehameha schools. Uh, as you know, we had a DOE um, school uh, guest in the past. We had Punahou, and tonight we thought, because of the rich history of the Kamehameha schools, to feature the two of you. So good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for having good us. Here. Welcome. Um, so, uh, let me see, Dave, who would you like to, do we have to do any housekeeping before we get started, we, before we get to the thick of it? Well, we always have to thank our sponsor, Hasser Wines, uh, for the wonderful wine and charcuterie board. Uh, Terry from Hasser Wines makes the charcuterie. Um, and so thank you for your continued support. It was wonderful to see Terry and Mike at our performances this weekend. So uh, thank you. Should we do a quiz? Do you have a quiz? Do we have a quiz question? Um, yes, we do. Where is he going to go with this? Where am I going to go? High or low? <laughs> um, so this past weekend, if you were at the show, uh, outside at the shell, you might have noticed that the cello section, as well as, as the uh, bass section, had tents above, right above them. And the triva, is it a trivia question really? The question is, why were those tents there this past weekend? Most creative answer wins. <laughs> No, I want to guess. Yeah, I, I love to guess. Because <laughs> I know the real answer. <laughs> so, um, with that transition, Gonzo, you are the director of network engagement uh, at the Kamehameha Schools, uh, a department focused on uh, supporting Kana Eo, I'm sorry, Kana Eo Kana, a network of over 50 schools and organizations that um, promotes, encourages, the uh, teaching of Hawaiian culture, is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, I'm very fortunate to be part of a team led by Dr. Kaunani Abad. Uh, we get to do all kinds of crazy community work. The best part of my job is that I get to work with um, people from across the Pai Aina uh, in, in growing Aloha Aina leaders, uh, the generation, the next generations. So it's a very uh, fulfilling kuleana that we have. Yeah. And we'll talk a lot more about the Aloha Aina in just a moment. Sure. And, and Zach, you also have your own uh, company, Kahului Leolea. Uh, you were uh, choir director at the Kamehameha Schools up until when? Up until 2020, the, the ending of the school year in 2020. And then I resigned to go and um, pursue a PhD in, um, in political science at, at Manoa. And before Dave uh, asked his usual question, I, I just wanted to ask the two of you, um, what makes Kamehameha School so special, as both are, of you are graduates? I'm going to defer to Gonzo first. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, firstly, I think what people, the first thing that comes to mind when people talk about Kamehameha Schools is that everybody has uh, Kanaka OED blood in them. 
But more importantly, I think what makes Kamehameha School so special is they start to foster those connections to place, to people, uh, past, present, and future. Um, they, they ground you in the culture that of, of this place. And um, I know that my, my experiences there were, I always look back very fondly. It's where I started my journey. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be forever grateful for. And so do you feel that by looking at their past, they're better able to look at the future? Absolutely, yeah. And, and Zach, what, what makes Kamehameha Schools special to you? Well, I, I, I would definitely echo what, what Gonzo shared about, you know, the, the nostalgia of, of growing up in an, an environment that's so rich with, um, with intention and with culture. And I think the thing that I would add to that is, um, you, you know, I think at, at the very root of it, Kamehameha Schools is this idea and it's this opportunity um, by, by someone who had so much foresight. Um, and the way that we, we, that idea and that opportunity has been expressed over time has, has varied in, in some cases, but, but for the most part, the trajectory has always been to, to invigorate uh, a people, right? Um, who perhaps are fo at the founder, Bernice Pohi Bishop, uh, saw as, as somewhat in trouble at the time. Um, so Kamehameha Schools to me is just a, it's an idea and it's an opportunity to, to make something better of, of the things that we already have and we're continuing to foster. So my question that starts this every single week is to take us back to the beginning. And since you're closest to me, Gonzo, you're going to have to <laughs> okay. go first. And, you know, we kind of leave it up to you. What, what is the beginning? Is it your time at Kamehameha? Is it, or is, is it before then? <laughs> Um, well, I started as an idea in my father's head, um, <laughs> you know, my mother. Uh, well, no, you know, all kidding aside, I, I think where I'm presently at now in my life, um, it's kind of a journey that kind of started when I was in high school at Kamehameha Schools, but didn't really take off until I went out, uh, jumped into a Hawaiian music band, did that for a little while, and it was through the, those initial relationships where I uh, got to work with some really great people had some really great mentors. I already mentioned one earlier at the top of the show, Dr. Keonani Abad. Um, there were my fellow bandmates as well, Chad Takatsugi. I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. Um, and it was through music and through mele and mo'olelo that I started to really connect to um, who I am, where I come from, and kind of, you know, kind of, it's kind of helping me to guide to where I want to go. So yeah, it's been kind of a, a, a crazy ride. I, you know, my mom was, God bless my mother. When I told her that I was dropping out of college to go join a band, she was just like, shoots. <laughs> she bought me an ukulele too, and she was super supportive, right? And I think, you know, out of all of the things that could help, you know, foster anybody having a really strong mother and even a father, supportive father, um, that was really good too. So what type of band was this? We played what we called traditional Hawaiian music, and we won't even get into the word traditional at, at right now. Um, but we will later. We played, yeah. we, we played, okay, later. We played something, um, and you know, looking back at it, it was, we, we, uh, me and my fellow or former bandmates look back and say, "Oh, that that was cute." You know, <laughs> it, it's a reflection of where we were at the time. You know, we're not running away from it, but um, you know, it it opened a lot of doors for us, not in terms of like our, our personal careers, um, but in terms of just like how we then saw ourselves in the world and how we then interact with that world around us um, and our, our place in, in, in that, that world. So, um, so Hawaiian music, it was a typical, we started off as a quartet, we had an upright bass, a couple of guitars, uh, ukulele or banjo too every once in a while, um, four, four vocalists, well three and a half because I wasn't really singing initially but then when the band went down to three, because you know how bands are. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, <laughs> We were down to three, then I had to sing, which was another kind of growth opportunity. So, yeah. Wonderful. Mm. I love it. And how about for you? Gonzo Take us back very, to the beginning. Uh, before I get into it, I think Gonzo's very shy and he's very <laughs> humbled. Like, he's a part of the award winning group Alea, oh. um, who just had a reprise um, this past weekend um, for, as we were recording for um, this year's Mary Monarch Festival. So, um, it was really cool to hear that group pop out of nowhere for a little while. Um, Thanks, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, I think for me, um, I don't know where it started. Um, and I think I'm really bad at like that kind of retrospection sometimes. So I have a really, I have a hard time answering these kinds of questions. But I guess um, the, 
the concept of like where where you came from and where you're going. Um, what what I'm starting to 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 think about or to maybe even consider is like maybe it's not maybe it's not linear, right? Maybe it's not this thing where oh, I'm coming, I came from, and I'm going to. But it's like maybe we're on a little bit more circular path, um, or or one that's um, not repeats itself but learns. Um, the path learns, and 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 we we become a part of that whatever that is. Obviously, I'm so articulate in this concept, but um, I, I, for, for me, where, where we come from, and, and going back to what Iggy was talking about previously, about you know, looking into the past as, as, as your future, um, or maybe looking at, into your future and how it reflects your past. Um, for me, that kind of concept just really drives me to, to keep doing things that, that seem to, to make sense or, or seem to be important. And you're, did you grow up in a family that uh, loved music, or where did your love of music come from? Yeah, I, um, my dad was in a band. He was in, um, the, they were called Oheo, and uh, they played Hawaiian music. I think they played, um, they played some island music, too. Uh, but when, when we were born, that might have been the end of his, like, Banned the officially, but you know he obviously still played music. He had to get yeah. a job. Yeah, 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 yeah probably. <laughs> and um, beyond that, like we were just we grew up around you know aunties and uncles and and you know eventually getting to commitment. I was in the Honolulu little boy choir, that, that kind of stuff. You know, cool opportunities. Gonzo, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, can you, someone who's still learning about all of the different genres of music that are here, you you. Sp- you said island music yeah. versus Hawaiian music. Can you define that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can. Um, I think the lines are very um, blurred. Yeah. Right. Um, between like reggae, island, mm-hmm. Hawaiian, traditional Hawaiian, contemporary Hawaiian. Contemporary yeah. Hawaiian. Um, yeah. And I think you can slice that pie a whole lot of different ways. Um, as far as like actually trying to articulate what the difference is. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the constant is, you know, um, when you look at our kupuna and what they did with technologies or instruments that they were introduced to or a new kind of musical concepts, they've always kind of adapted and evolved. They're really good at that, um, not just in music, but in just you know, everything that they did. Um, today, I think in some ways we, we kind of continue in that tradition. Some people are more rooted than others, I think, in that regard. But, um, you know, the, just the creative expression of being able to tell stories in whether it's an island style or island music style or contemporary or traditional music style, there's an audience for that. And I think that's uh, important to just try and get people to connect, mm. to, to find that vessel that resonates with the listener because you don't really have a, you need that relationship between the performer and the, the, the listener to then make that connection. Um, so in terms of how you distinguish them, yeah, that's, I don't even want to <laughs> yeah. offend. Uh, yeah, for, for uh, fear of offending anybody. Yeah, I'm sure you won't offend anyone. But it's a little bit like you know, in classical music, when you had uh, Bach or Mozart, they were inspired by what was going on around them and different culture. You know, uh, Mozart uh, was inspired by uh, news, a percussion instrument from the Ottoman Empire. Um, you know, and and, and so forth. Um, so, but really specifically, you are someone young and you, you grew up on the islands and so you're immersed in, in Hawaiian music. And when is the point where, because I, I think I read something about the Hawaiian music and Meli, where at some point do you realize that it's not just skin deep, the music is not just skin deep, but that there's a lot more um, history to be learned, uh, and and I know you are aware of it, but do you feel that it needs to be taught more these days? Do you feel like all of you um, making, um, playing, performing, and singing Hawaiian music are all one together because you, ha- you have this common knowledge? Or uh, I'm sorry, it's still a very general question. No, and it's a really cool question. Um, maybe I'll, I think Gonzo's gonna Gonna, well, I'll, I'll say something first, Gonzo. So, because I think he wants to talk about this too. So I, I would say that, um, you know, there's there's Hawaiian music and then there's mele, right? Um, and I think that's what you're referring to. Um, 
and, and when it comes to Hawaiian music, or, or just music in general, um, I don't know if it's universal or not, I, I wouldn't go that far, but the fact that it, um, that experience, right, of, of kind of like this manipulation of time and you get to be a part of that, you get to be in it, um, it kind of implies all of these kinds of connections, I think. Uh, whether that's the connection between the audience and the performer or the, or the audience and the audience or the performers and the performers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think when, when we start to apply that to these connections or this connectivity toward uh, a, a musical, musical practice that's actually inherently full of knowledge, and, and I think that's kind of the, the position that I like to take is like, Hawaiian music isn't mele um, because Hawaiian music is more about like what it sounds like for me, and, and mele is more about like the, the words, um, and like you know we we learned this in a um, in, in when I was getting my my music degree, you know the Hawaiian music is a logogenic music, it, it's words first, and and it's music after or at, sometimes at the same time, but but the words matter the most. Um, so when we when we are able to combine, as in all, all kinds of vocal musics, right? We can combine what we want to say with the this musical apparatus. You're starting to create this experience for for everybody to be included in. Um, I forgot where I was going to go because I, I was thinking about you, Gonzo. Oh, that's, I, that's perfect. I'm I, sorry. I think in terms of including people, making um, you know, if music is kind of this this vessel to make complex sometimes imaginary or really hard to explain ideas and concepts, it's a really great way to try and articulate that out for somebody to then receive that. So it then becomes accessible, whether it's a, a, a beautiful melody or awesome poetry, it's also very political. It can also be very powerful, um, especially with mele. Um, and if you look at even like Oli, right, um, it, it wasn't just, uh, it, it was a way to transmit knowledge, right? It's, we were a very oral, oral culture, that's how we transmitted knowledge, it wasn't just um, well, it was obviously words, but it was a repository for like scientific knowledge, right? You look at like um, some of the chants where they're talking about Kane. Um, yes, he's, he was a god and here are plants, but they're also talking about the water cycle, what we, we know as, you know, condensation, evaporation and all that other stuff. And so when you look at it through that lens and you realize, oh, Mele has this real powerful um, way of connecting with people. And it can be as deep as the listener wants because, it, you know, you can be somebody that's totally oblivious to those types of connections, but you'll be drawn in because, oh, that was a beautiful melody or that resonated with me because of my personal experiences. And that's what you want to do. You want to create that connection. So then you can pull them into what it is that you're trying to communicate to create that community, right? So earlier you're talking about like how important is music or art? It's so important because in a world where technology is, you know, ironically getting us supposedly more connected, but we're getting more disconnected. We were having a conversation prior to coming on air about, you know, the trepidation of a certain night and what that meant for the future, what that meant really about, what that said about us more so than what was happening in that one area. I think, you know, music has that opportunity to bring people together because it can be a very shared experience, yeah, mm -hmm. or in melee especially, and melee can be really powerful. You describe yourself as a, as a, uh scribe, modern day scribe, <laughs> because you want to make sure that everything from the melee is, is, can be found in, in writing? Well, I mean, I think I, I, I'm just very lucky to be around people that know more than I do. I'm constantly just in that position of just always um, being amazed by the, the wealth of knowledge that's around me. And my job is just amplify, whether it's a community person on the front lines of a very important issue around Aina, or if it's um, you know, the people that I get to work with closely, I try and just help to find ways to kind of amplify that message to get it out so that more people can connect to that kind of thinking, to that, that kind of way of seeing the world in a way that we kind of really need to get back to because if we continue down on this trajectory, you know, when you're talking about um, whether it's agri the, the massive agricultural farming thing, I know I'm going off on a tangent, or climate change, I mean, it's all interconnected, right? We gotta be better connected to each other and to place, you know, and that's where Aina comes in. If we can have those relationships again, then we'll, we'll, we'll solve some of those things um, you know, food security, the, the challenges with water, um, you know, uh, all, all of that stuff, if we can just start getting back to those basics. So, yeah. Um, you talk a lot about connectivity and, and I'll get back to it, but so from the symphonic world, so we are instrumental group and, and um, so we do have uh, works that feature voices, you know, choir, operas and so forth. But, a lot of what we do is uh, communication 
uh, be onwards. So um, we do have quite a, uh, a variety of composers who are very much inspired by um, Hawaiian culture. Um, but I wanted to know, maybe you're, I mean, it's hard for you because you're not hearing the piece at the moment, but like, for instance, we have um, Don Womack, who's uh, a professor at UH of composition, and he wrote um, a piece for the symphony. And um, he, his, one of his works is called Na Ivi O Pele, The Bones of Pele. And it's inspired because um, he loves the Haleakala creator on Maui, and he says that below the slopes of uh, the Haleakala lie masses of broken lava said to be the remnants of a terrifying battle between Pele, goddess of fire, and her sister Namakaokawai, goddess of the sea. And so a whole, and actually that piece is maybe not a whole orchestra, but an ensemble, and, and very much inspired by this story. And um, so he's not trying to, what we call it, create program music. Well, oh, this is the part well, this is happened. Right. This is the, no, it's more of a mood uh, um, and ideas. And so we also had recently John Magnusson. Um, he wrote a, a concerto two uh, for one oboe, excuse me, uh, called Two Season or Nakao Elua, and which reflects the lunar moons of the Hawaiian year. And it's a concerto that um, features the, the, the oboe, and the oboe, that particular oboe, was made of um, the Kaolia woods from Kauai from the, the wow. hurricane. Yeah. And, and so, um, this is the symphony's effort to kind of ensure the legacy of Hawaiian culture, even though we, we're not able to always put words to it. Uh, do you have any thought on that? Yeah, I think I mean, it's, it's maybe not like super, the first thing that would come to mind, but I mean, I, I think it's as equally valuable. Well, I, I think what's so cool about that is, and I love the way you say it, it's, it, it you're communicating beyond words, right? And I think even though as, as word-centric we are as, as, uh, as an oral culture, but I mean, yes, we're, we're more than an oral culture now, uh, but the fact that I think a lot of words that we have express things that don't speak themselves. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't use words. So it, words... There, there are so many, you know, people I, I hear all the time, like, you know, there are so many words for rain and there's so many words for this kind of miss and that kind of, like, and, and the reason for that is because it, it's, uh, there's descriptors for, for the personalities of the elements that, that are around us, right? And I think when, it, when I hear what you're saying, it's, also, it, it's as if, you know, sound becomes that experience of, of connecting to environment, right? Um, whether, you know, and, and it's so nice to hear those, uh, those names. They were both my professors, uh, <laughs> Professor Womack, Professor um, Magnuson, um, when I was in my, my bachelor's. And it, anyway, it, it, it's such a, um, it's almost, would you call it like a tone poem? Like, yeah, yeah, um, yes, quite, quite possibly, yes, so, absolutely. So, so it just makes me think like, you know, how do we capture that which doesn't speak in the first place anyway, right? And, and I think that's such a wonderful way to, to do that. Yes. Yeah. Is that, uh, Gonzo, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, well, like, um, how do you capture that which does not speak? I, I think, you know, um, I love how, whether it's a tone poem or if it's music or if it's the sound of a particular makani or the sound of a certain kind of rain, because they all sound different too, if you actually listen to it. It's not just rain. There's, a, there's you know, specific rains, depending on whether it's little tea, misty, or heavy, big yeah. drops, right? Uh, all of those sounds. Um, to be able to bring that to somebody who's never experienced that, to bring them in, again, it's just about bringing them in so that you can make that connection. Um, I think that's beautiful. So, I mean, if, if Naivi Opele or um, some of the other works are even incorporating those elements that have, you know, intent and purpose that come from that place and you're doing that melody for that place, it's su super, you know, very... Very beautiful on so many levels, right? Getting those different layers of connectivity and, and inten intention. Yes. Um, I think that's what we need to get back to in general as people, whether we're musicians or whether we're doctors or lawyers or poets or whatever, or farmers, right? Like to have that type of intentionality in the stuff that we do, that's what we should all be striving for. So connecting that, how do we do that? How do we take something that's hundreds of years old and, and make it relevant to 
uh, today's noise that we're all caught within. Um, I mean, I, th I think I'm glad you bring up noise because social media is just, you know, as technology has progressed, it's been easier for people to have their platforms. As there's more platforms, there's more people competing for your attention, right? And so how do you get the really good stuff in front of them? Um, you got to have resonance amongst a core group of people that have influence, um, you know, whether that's through the symphony or whether that's through a social media channel or a media agency. And you got to have the right people controlling those. Um, maybe controlling is not the right word, but the, those that are in the driver's seat sharing those messages out so you can create um, the, the, the waves that then bring people in and they can start, you know, influencing their notes. I think it starts with just, you know, this is overly simplistic, but creating that relationship on a very one on one level whether that's to me and Zach, or me and you, Dave, whom uh, it's a pleasure meeting you, um, or me and to this place. Like, how can I just be present? And how can I, um, you know, for, when, you, when you look at whether it's land or Aina, right? It's not something that you own or something that's, that's um, commodified or something that's leased. It's actually this living, breathing entity. How do you get your mind into that space so that then you can have those, those spaces to create those relationships? Um, so I guess maybe the short answer is start with those one-on-one -on -one connections yeah. and just being in tune and, and being quiet and um, being open to absorbing it all in, yeah, as a listener. Yeah. You know? yeah. And as an educator, how do you introduce that to high school students? Experientially, most definitely. And I think one of the things that, that I'm definitely most proud of in, in the experiences that we've been able to facilitate for our students were um, none of them happened in the classroom. It was all a matter of let's learn these songs um, because we're going to perform them in the context for which it was, uh, uh, it, for it, for which it was written for, or for the intention uh, being able to align the performance of a mele with the people and the place of that same mele. Um, I can't tell you how many times one could even call it. Um, and I hate to use this term, but it's almost like supernatural where it's like, yeah, we're going to sing this line and that that line talks about that makani and guess what? That makani is going to blow during that line. You know, like it, it's 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 too too perfect to be coincidental. And, and I think that's when we start to dive or at least scratch the surface of, of what it means to be a practitioner of, of mele. Um, in relation to the connections that are around us, to, to Aina, to people. Um, you know, I, I, we used to go to uh, Kona every December with our, with our seniors in the Concert Glee Club. And we would visit specific places. We would learn the songs of that places first so that when we performed them, we understood that that expression that came out of those beautiful young voices was actually just a, 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 an expression of something larger. Um, and and I, I think that's what's so inherently aloha aina. Um, it's this understanding that I have deep connection and empathy to the larger system of existence, right? Most people think of aina as just like land. Um, but there's a lot of other, you know, um, not theories, I wouldn't call them theories, but, but really just understandings of, of what aina really implies for so many, um, not just Hawaiians, but just as a concept. Yeah. I love what you're saying about, you know, the, to answering Dave's question about it being experiential for the learner. A lot of the kula in the Kanao Kana network, one of the hallmarks of Hawaiian culture-based education is project-based, aina-based, getting them out into these spaces to experience and feel, smell, touch, breathe, and, and engaging as many senses as you can. Gone are the days of us at a desk, rote memorization, pounding, you know, formulas. Let's go out and let's practic practice and do it and, and, and do it in ways that made sense to our kupuna, but also are relevant to us today. Um, so the more that we can do that, even in an educational setting, then we become more successful in creating and growing the types of aloha aina leaders that we hope to kind of see the society and become their own nodes of connectivity and they can be the influencers. Yeah, so well, You just said something really interesting too. It's like it's privileging practice knowledge be before um, what we would consider to be like a Western, you know, institutionalized education, which is something so interesting because that simply, it simply reflects the oral nature of, of our culture, right? Like the only way you're going to learn is if you actually have to do, you have to, you have to say the, the language, you have to say the words that, that are um, encoded with meaning. And that's the only way you're going to actually know it. Um, beyond that, like I, it's hard to imagine today, right? That 
we, we couldn't write, um, that there was no method of, of transcription. It was all just whatever you knew, you knew because you could practice that. And I think in, in many ways, mele is this like practiced literacy, right? It's this practiced knowledge, practiced um, knowing. So I, I, I love what you're saying there, Kanzo. It reminds me, um, I, I'm going to lower the level of uh, smartness here, but uh, <laughs> for a long time, even though I've been here for a long time, I, I wouldn't dare say the word aloha when we would talk to people or make a speech because I just never felt that I could feel it uh, or I didn't know what it meant. I, it just felt like, you know, um, um, someone from the mainland, you know, advertising a trip to Hawaii. And, and so I, I think I somewhat feel more comfortable now. Not, maybe not because I know the meaning better, but I just feel more as, as, as one with, with, with it. So um, yeah, I, I just felt like that. Um, you, you, you mentioned a lot about connectivity and, and having to experience this connectivity person to person and not via social media or um, 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 Zach, uh, speaking of tourism, you, you mentioned in your May Day, I think there was um, about the connectivity between the Kama'aina and the visitor, especially in these times where we all need economy recovery. Can you expand a little bit of, of how we can, is it maybe a clean slate where we make, can maybe kind of look through a new lens or of this, this rapport? Yeah, I, if I had the answer to that, gosh, like that would be really great. <laughs> like, I think everyone's trying to figure out what, what, what are the next steps forward, right? Because I mean, we're in a situation where it, tourism drives economy, but it also is kind of like a, you're digging yourself too, right, into the hole. But, you know, I, I don't mean to be so morbid like that. But I, I, when it comes to the idea of, of kama aina malihini, in this relationship that's called makaikai. And I really have to credit my, my kumu, kumu Kaikina de Silva, who, um, who theorizes this in her, in her dissertation. And that's who I got to speak with um, in, in the Mayday program. And we, we, we tried our best not really, and, and I don't think we really nailed down any clear understandings or suggestions, or this is what it should be, and this is what it's not. And you know, I, I don't think that was really the goal. I think it was really just to start a conversation so that maybe you and I Iggy, can continue to have that conversation to here today. I think that that was, that, that you just brought that up. It, it brings me so much happiness that we can continue to have this conversation. And, and to, to answer your question really quick, I think the, the idea of makaikai implies that um, when, I, uh, when you have a guest that comes over to your house, right? Like, you don't just open the door and then like, okay, go inside. Like the first time ever been to a house, go inside. Like, and, and just let them roam around, right? Like that's not what you would do in your house. You would kind of, something that you'd often hear is like, oh, let me give you the tour. You know, like, let me, let me show you around. This is I don't know, the living room or <laughs> like, this is the backyard or whatever. Uh, but, but the point is, is that the experience of Makaika is a, is a guided one, um, one that, relies on the Kama'aina's hosting so that the Malihini can then understand that there is, a, I don't want to call it a hierarchy, but an understanding that, um, yeah, I am the guest, right? And, and there are certain understandings and, and ways to be a guest, and there are certain understanding and ways to be a host. Um, and it's, it's a two, there are two parties there, maybe there are more. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I, thank you for bringing that up. No, no. I'm, um, I, I think that uh, that concept of you're in, if you're in that role of a guest, then how do you behave in a way that you're not just extractive? How do you reciprocate? How do you um, regenerate? Right. So whether you're talking about a circular economy or you're talking about some of these other buzzwords that are flying around in terms of economic revitalization, yeah. it's really about um, regeneration and stuff that you can give back. Um, so, and and you know, hearing your your personal story about your uncomfortableness of, of just even simply articulating aloha out to. I mean, I'm sure you've felt it before. Um, whether you're talking about um, what, what Zach was talking about or what you're sharing, like Hawaiian culture isn't just for Hawaiians. It's, it's really for everybody if they're willing to kind of, uh, you know, engage in those relationships that are really important. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that you're at a space now where you're, you feel like you're finally comfortable to say aloha. And, and, and you know, that's the kind of people that 
at least in the work that I'm privileged to be a part of nowadays, is that we're trying to bring in those people that aren't necessarily Hawaiian, but mm. um, there's so much knowledge and, um, you know, when people talk about traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge uh, and how that could potentially save the world, I truly believe that, right? So if the more people that we can bring into that fold that aren't necessarily Hawaiian by blood, but can be Hawaiian in thought and perspective or indigenous in thought by perspective, um, that gets back to maybe like, how do we do that? How do we get more connectivity? We get people thinking on that same wavelength, having those better relationships, then, you know, maybe we have a chance as a humanity in general. So what is that journey like? For instance, if you uh, met someone who uh, was thrown on this island and was isolated for 14 months and only got to view this experience of Hawaii through Zoom, um, <laughs> what, what is that journey like? I mean, I think you gotta go where people are at, right? So whether that's introducing them through a song, uh, just music catching them with a melody. Oh, that's cool, that's catchy. You know, they're humming it, whatever. Like whatever it is that gets their mind, even the door just a little bit open, um, you gotta find that sweet spot for people. So that could be something on Instagram or on Facebook or, or music or food or, or just having that really gracious host that then, or the guide really, that kind of shows them how to act, whether that's through Zoom or through an actual heala or heala, face-to-face -face relationship. Um, it starts with just kind of making true and genuine connections with people and place and, and, and all of that. So, um, I don't know, it sounds overly simplistic, but I mean, I think if we can just try and focus in on that, then yeah, we got a, we got a so, shot. So concretely, so Dave has been on Zoom for the last 15 months, right? Um, so we, ha we sometimes have this segment called To Dave with Aloha. <laughs> um, so he can discover the treasures of our islands. And I hear he, has, oh. he, he rolls with good friends like um, Aaron, and yeah. you know, he's got lunch yes, with he Aaron does. Salah tomorrow. And yeah. Absolutely. So Zach, what hands. would you uh, tell um, uh, Dave to uh, enjoy? To Dave with Aloha, I would say, um, I don't know, I, I, there's so much, you know? And I think the magic moments are those that we don't expect. Um, and, and Gonzo said it well, it's like, you know, whether that's a song or a or like the, the smell of the rain or, or, or something. I think when, when we derive meaning from, from these seemingly meaningless points in our lives, uh, we start to realize that like, oh wait, it's not just me or it's not just us, it's, it's we're, we're part of something. And, um, and I think that's, you know, aloha becomes one of those expressions, back to what Iggy was saying, like aloha becomes one of those expressions of an acknowledgement that, oh, well, how nice it is to be a part of something big, um, bigger. Um, yeah, that's, that doesn't answer the question at all, though, Iggy, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I, I did have a question, but I think I, I lost my, my, my track. Um, um, anyway, I'll move on to, 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 to the famous Kamehameha School Song Contest. Okay. Um, first of all, Technically speaking, is there a technique that you have to follow or observe when you sing in a choir as opposed to if you sing solo or in a band? Yes, I would say yes. Um, I don't know how to expound upon that yes, though. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's very situational, right? Um, and I'm, not, I'm nowhere near a choral pet pedagogy, you know, I'm, I'm not up and up with, with everything that's going down now. But um, I think in the context of getting uh, teenagers, um, <laughs> oh, see, you're already laughing. Like, there's a, whole, there's a long list. Um, teenagers who don't want to sing, some of them. Some of them love singing. Some of them are tone deaf. Some of them are tone deaf. Yeah. Um, and some of them, most all of them at one point, are, their voices are changing. Um, and then you make uh, participating in an a cappella 450 member choir a graduation requirement, um, and you elect uh, a student leader, and you sing Hawaiian language songs. This year, tw in 2020, 2021, for the first time, it, they were songs that were written in part by students. Um, because before in the past, it was by the Kumu? There were uh, actually, in, in, I, I think there are some instances in that was the case, but for the most part, the, each year w was themed, at least themed. for the past yeah. few um, decades. And um, so these are pre-existing songs, and there are some classics. They, they become commitment right. school's of classics, course. right? Um, but yeah, you add up all of these variables, and it's like, 
it creates a very seemingly vivid picture of, of what that means to, to go to Kamehameha. Um, I, I think about our teacher, Les Sabalos, who, who, was, who, was, who said at one point, you know, people wonder why uh, people are so close at Kamehameha, and it's, and it's because of this, this shared experience of Five song minutes. contest. Yeah, yeah. Being, being, being in intense rehearsals. Um, and, so and so the, the contest is, is in March. When do you start preparing for that? April, like right after the last one finished. Uh, it's a year-round thing, um, maybe not for the students. The students, you know, the, the whole rehearsal process for song contest starts in December, January, um, and then that takes them right up, right up into it. In a normal year, right? Um, last year was definitely not normal, neither was this one. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's always a really fun conversation because I think like what Gonzo was saying, like there's, there's a certain nostalgia behind anyone who's been a part of any part of song contest, right? There's always like, I remember that. I remember this. We lost this year. We won this year. That's always like the, the best one. People, people always think that they're a point away from winning and you know, there's all of these dramatic stories, which are so entertaining. Um, but again, become this point of, of shared experience, right? Be, for time, like Gonzo and I weren't in school at the same time, but we can still chat about song contests. Oh. Um, yeah, really cool experience, uh, facilitation of experiences. Uh, Gonzo, what was your personal experience with the song contest? I mean, the, there was definitely the competitive aspect, and then you know the the fear of making fame on statewide TV that was always kind of hung over our heads. You don't want to be that class that you know fill in the blank. <laughs> um, but I mean, you, you know, if I'm reflecting on it now, with in my older days um you know that i again that that idea of resonance just getting thousands of teenagers singing in a lot of hawaii um maybe connecting some of them not realizing how they're connecting at that moment but maybe later on in life it makes sense um it's why we can have those conversations me and zach you know decades later even though we're decades apart in classes we're decade we decades and a half. Dec decade okay, decade and a half. okay i'm not that old yeah you're not that old you can still call me uncle, though. Okay, uncle. Okay. Yeah. No, don't call me uncle. Um, but I think it's it's that you know that that resonance or those that shared experience. Because and even on a logistical level, sometimes the songs come up over and over again, right? Because you're pulling from the tried and true composers. This past year, Zach was mentioning it was partially composed by um, the students with the the guidance of some really profound hakumele um, living today, talking about issues that are current today, which is which is beautiful, right? I mean. Um, to have mele that are speaking about our times and our issues and our challenges, not only for the sake of us articulating it now, but for our kids and our kids' kids to look back and be like, what were they talking about then? How are they facing these challenges? They can look to these mele. They can look to these ex experiences. And then so in, in that sense, um, the, that experience of song contest is just a platform for us to kind of then, you know, have, share, share these, these uh, mo'olelo and, mm. and have these, these experiences. What instigated that change this past year? Oh, um, actually, Zach would have good insight to that. It was actually supposed to be last year's theme. Is that correct? Yeah. The Aloha Aina theme. So we had the 2020 was supposed to, is the 100th song contest. Um, so 100 years of, of, like, we don't have cultural programs, institutions that have lasted quite as long. Um, there are a few. So to be able to use that as, like, a, a measuring stick of, of how far we've come, um, the, we thought it would be such a really cool way to celebrate by um, not documenting the hundred years that have passed, but celebrating the hundred years that have passed by documenting now for the hundred years to come. Um, and doing that was a logistical, that was, that was um, incredibly rewarding to, to bring in um, Master Hakumele um, and 100 and 20 or I can't remember, it was about 120 students volunteered to be a part of these, what we called Hakumele cohorts. And they, um, they, they met after school all, all on their own time, um, working with these, these experts, not only in Hakumele, but in the things that they were writing about. The topics ranged from water diversion in Maui to um, the Hanapepe, Hanapepe salt, salt ponds, ponds uh, to uh, the 2018 um, flooding in Hanalei to the was it 2018 Fisher 82? I can't remember. I know. Um, you know, it, it, all of these very recent events, even some that are not as recent. Um, talking about Kalau Papa, um, and, and you know the the very well known story there. Um, and at the time, we thought this is these are all stories of Aloha Aina. 
and, and I haven't gotten to share this with, with a lot of people. I think I may have shared it with Gonzo, but in hindsight, we realized that like on the cusp of this pandemic, um, the, which can be understood as a hulihia, um, how, what's a, what's, how do you, turning? What, like a, a turning point in, in the, uh, I think of hulihia as when the lava um, rolls out and it destroys and creates at the same time. So the pandemic is, it's kind of like a hulihia. Anyway, all 10 songs that were written are also stories of hulihia. Um, and so it's, <laughs> it's as if the entire world conspired and was expressed through these, um, these beautiful students and hakumele in such a way that this, this theme and these, these, the ability to, to share our stories conspired um, to, to create something that's, um, that's still resonating. And I, th I think what was beautiful about um, Kamehameha schools and those that were choosing the theme for the 100th of Aloha Aina, I think it was coming on the heels of yep. the movement of Mauna Kea, yep. which was like the largest expression outward expression, I think, for a lot of people in terms of the general public and just this consciousness of what is Aloha Aina and how can you love something so much that you're going to be willing to defend and chain yourself to the cattle guard for eight hours in the freezing cold and the blazing heat, putting your life on the line, right? Um, so uh, I, I think, you know, again, Mele being this beautiful vessel, like people will, might clam up when as soon as you start talking politics or some really heavy duty issues where everybody has really strong rooted positions. But as yep. soon as you put it in the form of a Mele or music, they'll be like, oh, nice cool, song. right? Like, in, in, you know, getting to some of the songs that had come out of that mountain movement. Sorry, I'm kind of moving this way. There's this beautiful song called Na Napu'uvai Haukila <laughs> that this guy wrote, but, you know, it also won a, a Hoku Award. It's so beautiful and it's almost like lullaby-ish. But you think about the moment that he's commemorating or trying to uh, amplify where it's kind of really violent. It was very tense. They didn't know what was going to happen. You had sheriffs over there with their guns and their, their stuff, but it's this very beautiful melody where the, the names of the, the people are actually kind of encoded in the, the lyrics. It's actually very beautiful. Um, but again, you, you try and talk to somebody about that moment. People have their opinions. It's hard to, to kind of wedge them from that, but you, you give them this melody and you kind of sneak it in there and they'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't know that. Gonzo, how do you separate the noise from the sound, um, meaning like you said, there's so much information out there. And as educators, you know, how do you tell your students where or who or how to listen? Because you can go online and pretty much you can find anything you want to believe in. Mm. Yeah. So I'm not that generation, but I, I mean, I would like to think that I've have my own thoughts and beliefs that are grounded in reality, <laughs> or at least ex my own experience, which is my own truth, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you have students who are, can be influenced in ways that are not so healthy, I mean, how do you, you know, find the truth? I think that definitely education is a key um, mechanism for them to begin at very young age teaching rooting them in who they are where they come from and what they stand for and giving them this worldview and perspective that it's not really all about them that it's there's this bigger picture how it's all interconnected they learn how to make their own choices um, based on you know their experiences in the culture that's wrapping them and, and embracing them and if it's a culture of community and if it's a culture of not commodification or, or capitalism and everything everything that might be taking us sideways on these, these tangents that don't really do anything for the human race other than line the pockets of certain individuals, um, I think we stand a better chance of, of um, making it through some of the really dark things that we're facing. So education to me is like, education. is how you try and get people to um, be able to separate those things and make the choices for themselves. Because um, for me, if somebody's older who didn't really have those experiences growing up and wasn't really embraced by the, the, the culture until much later in life, I think you know, I was fortunate to just be around people that grew up that way or just understood that way and then they kind of welcomed me in. So, I mean, whether, again, whether it's through Mele or it's through the orchestra experience, like bringing people in, embracing them, giving them what, what, what they're willing to kind of intake at that moment. I mean, we gotta just keep feeding them these, these awesome kind of opportunities for them to, to connect, you know, first emotionally and then, you know, experientially. Um, and then they'll be able to make better decisions on how to separate the noise from, from sound and what the stuff that truly matters, I think. Zach, any thoughts? Lots, lots of thoughts. And I think the biggest one for me would just be 
the the connections that that occur um, in the most uh, intimate is not the right word, but but in the most sincere ways. Um, and the reason why I say it like that is, you know, Gonzo is talking about how, how do you? Uh, well, I guess what what you're talking about is is how do you separate the noise from the sound, right? Um, and I think we distinguish sound from noise based on um, what the the meaning we, de we we derive from that sound, right? Um, that's music and that's not music. That's some noise, right? Um, so then who gets to decide what the music is? Um, I think it, it becomes a literacy of, oh yeah, that is music, right? Um, and and that, that, that does resonate with me. And the only reason why I can have that sincere understanding is because of, I, I've experienced that on a personal level, right? I've, I, that's something that maybe was taught to me, maybe I grew up around, but on a, maybe on a more general sense, being able to recognize those, uh, those opportunities, not, I know we say connection a lot in, you know, in the past hour, but, but in, this, in the relationships um, that, that are sincere and, and allow us to really tap into all of these things, that, that's, to me, what, what helps us distinguish sound from noise, music from sound and then theme, and then, you know, everything that eventually becomes uh, an experience for us. I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to name two bands. You tell me music or noise. Don't <laughs> dare. <laughs> yeah, Alea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Noise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of co connectivity, um, I, I forgot to uh, give a big, huge shout out to uh, the person who made your presence responsible and who is Lizzo Hoglum Alcantara or Lizzo Alcantara Hoglum, excuse me. Um, hi Lizzo, uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have uh, Gonzo and Zach here tonight and uh, we owe this to you very much so. Um, back to the song contest, you have to choose a leader. Um, what are the criteria to be a leader? Um, the the leader is ultimately uh, elected by his or her class. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it would be a popularity contest. Uh, in, in many cases, it, it is. Um, they don't have any musical. But that's not too... <laughs> yeah, they, well, they, 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 there, is, there, is a, there is a music test that they have to pass. Okay. Um, there's an application process that talks about, you know, what kind of grades are you getting and that kind of stuff. There's an extracurricular activity to be a director, right? So... Grades have to be, you have to be like the, a really good student, um, really responsible in the things that you do outside of just your academics. And yeah, ultimately, the, uh, much like a stage like this, imagine like 450 people sitting there, um, your classmates. In white. Yeah, at 7.35 a.m. <laughs> um, and it's time to elect people. So, okay, sing, sing the school song, Sons of Hawaii. And one by one, um, each uh, candidate uh, will, will come and direct their class. And then when that's done, pass out the paper ballots and everybody votes. I'm actually um, traumatized by the experience because our class elected the guy that was the worst. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to apologize. Right? I'm, I won't say what year. Okay, there was this one year where... And it's going to be obvious. Like, I know, well, this guy's watching this, right this now. This person did this wild kind of really interpretive thing to just get everybody to stand up and everybody's like, ooh. And that was the criteria for why they selected that this person. And I was just, I was, I was just beside myself. This may be a good here. transition, Dave, to our <laughs> trivia question. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, perhaps we did have a, we did have a winner, and it, it this should complete her um, half case collection. Yes, yeah. her half case. Mari uh, had the correct answer, uh, and. Uh, the correct answer was, oh, there, there are the tents. Yes. Uh, thank you to City Mill uh, for your, short, your support. Um, <laughs> there's a bit of a bird issue at the Waikiki Shell currently. Uh, they have taken over during the pandemic, and we had a few incidents with our chalice and uh, decided to just erect some tents. Why would the birds only the choose the chalice? I was just going to ask the same <laughs> question. I know. Why not the violin? And for next week's say, question, no, for next week's, uh, no, we'll keep those thoughts to ourselves. Yeah. Um, it, I think it was just they're at the front of the stage. Okay. I think is is really. Um, <laughs> so um, um, the Casimir brothers, um, Robert, most lastly, and um, 
um, Lester Ballas have been frequent uh, guests of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra in the past. Yeah. Uh, tell us uh, about them and, and what they brought to you, you as students. Lots. <laughs> we, we were just with um, Les. With yeah, with Mr. Sabalos. He was he was my teacher um, in concert glee. Um, he was there when you folks were he there. He was there. Too. I was actually a band geek. I wasn't in concert. I wasn't good enough to be in concert glee at the time. Right. But um, <laughs> I was fortunate to have him as a a mentor and like a, a vocal coach and then got to play with him a few times it just like this past was it saturday yeah for mary monarch yeah he yeah he um put together a, a, a beautiful arrangement of my cut ey po and he lave um and then speaking of intention he brought lorna who's from kohala and then the arrangements that he was using were some uncle randy fong arrangements so he had some kamehameha dna in the band choices and some i mean it was kind of wacky but in terms of Less, he's always awesome like that. Yes. Um, he's very animated. I'm sure you guys know, or yeah, yeah you know. Well, me. I feel like if you're a professional classical singer, <laughs> you have to be very animated. I'm, sure. I, I'm, compared to instrumentalists like myself, you know, where we can be laid back, yeah. uh, backstage. Then on, on stage, maybe sometimes we um, bring it up, but, uh, <laughs> but I feel like classical music singers, whether it's on stage or backstage or off stage, it's always very animated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's animated. always on stage. Yeah. <laughs> He's very entertaining, <laughs> fun to be around. Yeah, yeah. he is. And, then, and, and Robert, my, my kumuhula, um, and overall just um, wonderful musical and mentor, um, I, I would say, is um, that, that experience is, is uh, the word that I, I like to use is magical. Like he, he, brings, on, he brings along magic, um, right? And it's not just about the beautiful voice that comes out of him, mm -hmm. it's, it's about how how time kind of stands still sometimes, right? Yeah. And, and he becomes, for that moment, uh, the master of that time. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, it's magic. Uh, one in embarrassing thought, I, uh, uh, stories, uh, actually my very, very first year in Hawaii uh, with the symphony back in 97, and we uh, featured uh, for one of our pops concerts, the Kazimur Brothers. And I was totally new to Hawaii, and I, I barely glanced at the title, and then I was telling my colleague, oh, so the, the Karamazov brothers are coming to town. <laughs> and who are the Karamazov? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dostoyevsky's? Or... Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was uh, my first uh, foray <laughs> with the Casimir brothers. And, and then, of course, I discovered them, and it was wonderful. So. No trapeze artist. No, no, no. <laughs> no. And you'll have another opportunity coming up because Robert will be joining us for a performance July two, three, and four, Beautiful. when we do music uh, for and by the Queen. Wow. Uh, in uh, partnership with the uh, Liliuokalani Trust. Uh, uh, so right. tickets will be available for that very soon here. Uh, the question that I like to close uh, is usually related to the future of the symphony, but as uh, a question came in, and I was sitting here thinking about this as well, um, how do you perpetuate uh, for the future generations the aloha, the aina, the Hawaiian culture? You know, how how do we go forward with this and 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 have that uh, more center of of mind and experience for the next generation? I think Gonzo has a has a better answer than what I'm going to say, but I I think simply it's it's just normalizing that that way of thinking. Um, and normalizing the way that we see the world. Um, and it's not an exclusive we, it's an inclusive we. Um, because it's not, a, a lot of this, these concepts may be expressed differently around the world, but I like to believe that they're all somewhat rooted in the, the larger existence that we, we call Aina. Um, but really, it, it, there's something for everyone to gain from normalizing um, what that looks like through, through new eyes or renewed mm -hmm. eyes. But Gonzo says it a lot better than no, I No, no. I mean, I think that's spot on. And in terms of like how we go about normalizing that, I think each of us have our own spaces of influence that we can do that in small micro ways. We can also be engaged in macro ways, whether that's civic engagement or through um, educational movements or just standing for what you believe in, um, in terms of whether it's something like Mauna Kea or, or stuff like that, and, and, or being a really good ally to those that 
might have those connections. You might not completely understand it, but you know it resonates with you in some way. But being a really good ally and helping to advocate for them in whatever ways that you can, um, that goes all towards normalizing um, those perspectives that can help kind of, I guess, save the world, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so to speak. Or literally. <laughs> or, or yeah, literally, yeah, quite literally. Yeah. Aloha Aina. This is, I guess, if we only had one or two words to remember from tonight, I guess this is what we should remember um, and be true to ourselves and be genuine in our connections. Uh, I think uh, as far as I know, that's all I can do. And the rest mm -hmm. will come, I guess. Mm -hmm. Dave, uh, how is your voice, your singing voice? My Would you singing be able voice? To, uh, to join the Kamehameha Choir, even if you're maybe a bit too old now? Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, no, I probably... I thought you were 18. Eight, oh, right. I, I did say that earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I am 18. Uh, yes. No, I don't, I don't think my voice is quite up to that. But it is an uh, experience I hope to have, uh, hopefully in the next year here, as things get back to, to normal, yeah, to experience that. Yeah, I hope so, that. too. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're out of time. This hour has just flown by. Yes. I mean, this is our 41st episode, I think, and I, the, nothing against any of our prior guests. This has been one of the most inspiring conversations uh, I think we've had on the show, and just really appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to speak with you and to learn from you both. Uh, so, you. yeah, Thank absolutely. You just absolute pleasure. So, uh, Iggy, next week. Uh, next week, we, um, the symphony actually will be back uh, at the Shell rehearsing. So um, we will probably have the pleasure to have a performing guest, I believe. So please stay tuned for tuning up next Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much, Gonzo. Thank you very much, Zach. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Thank Dave. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you next Tuesday, and we'll see you at the Waikiki Shell the rest of the summer. Aloha.